I did what you asked. I gave you my DNA to access Master Mold. <laughs> Kill me, please. For what happened in Genosha? Don't take all the blame, Oliver. Why, Genosha was merely the beginning of a prologue, now past. You have nothing to fear, so long as you place your faith in Sinister. <laughs> <laughs> we shall not live our days wondering if we could have saved more. We face this as we always have. What's going on guys? Bart here with Tully Television. I want to thank all of you for stopping by, liking, commenting, sharing, all that beautiful YouTube stuff. I hope that today is the day that I feel like I don't have a bunch of stuff in my eye. <laughs> um, I hope that today is the day that we earn your subscription. If so, you hit that red, red subscribe bar down below. Hit all the bell notifications. Because only together can we go straight to the moon, baby. Uh, with growing our community here at Tully Television. Uh, today we're going to be getting into X-Men 97. Uh, episode 6. Entitled Life, Death, Part 2. And um, we pick up uh, and end the Storm Forge storyline. And we also follow up what Charles Xavier has been doing while in space. I'm going to kind of just go through each story separately. Uh, so I try not to confuse myself, but through, throughout the episode, they uh, stagger the story until at the end. And then things get really, uh, really left to wondering where and how things are going to go. As far as Storm and Forge are concerned, uh, during their last encounter with the adversary, Forge had become injured in his shoulder. And as Storm was trying to help him recover, despite her current feelings for him about the one being, uh, him being the one that created the weapon that took her powers away, uh, they find out that there's a special herb, possibly, uh, that is off in the lands that they would have to get in order to help heal him better, heal him faster, uh, because of the type of injury that it is. Uh, but while during this time, uh, Storm had faced off against the adversary again in Forge's cabin, facing some of her worst fears like claustrophobia, not being able to be around to help her friends and family uh, or and just help the world in general. Uh, but that claustrophobic feeling she gets is from a childhood trauma that she endured uh, when her family's home was attacked uh, during, a, during a war in her country and her parents wanted up perishing and she got uh, stuck under a huge pile of rocks and, and rubble. So she had gained uh, claustrophobia during that time. And so the adversary is using those type of fears against Storm. And uh, initially it seems like Forge was able to create a spell from this book he had that kind of looked like Dr. Strange's uh, spell um, effects, if you will, and they thought they took the adversary back uh, away. But when they finally get to the old mountain that Forrest was talking about, uh, where that special herb and medicine would be, it was used during the Civil War era to uh, keep uh, supplies like weapons and stuff like that. And um, that's where the legend of all that came from, of the flower. Storm was able to, again, uh, defeat her fear of claustrophobia by uh, tunneling through a pathway in the mountain 
finding the herb, and then again, facing the adversary uh, because of the fear that it was feeding off of until finally Storm uh, gains enough confidence in herself and learns to live with her feel, uh, live with her fear and is able to have her abilities return and uh, she storms out, okay? Uh, either destroying the adversary or at least defeating them enough to where they went off somewhere. But the animation sequence to this of uh, Storm regaining her powers was an amazing sequence of animation. This animation in the series has been so good that I'm tired of talking about how good it is. Damn it. Not really. Keep it up, guys. Whoever is doing the animation to this, if you ever happen to come across this video for some reason, you're doing a great job. You really are. And I hope that the future of Marvel animation stays within this group of people who are doing this uh, particular series. Uh, that's how I like, really... Because when she storms out, you can kind of even see the effects from outer space uh, in the atmosphere, the way her storm powers are, or weather powers are you know, gathering. It was really an amazing sequence. And then uh, when she's flying, uh, she's flying with her, uh, for lack of a better term, of a herd of horses that are running in the desert. And she's flying with them and uh, she was able to, you know, feel like the goddess that she is destined and meant to be. And at the end of their story, while Forge and her are uh, celebrating their victory, uh, celebrating the fact that they were able to find the herb and help Forge, and the fact that they acknowledge that maybe there's some genuine feeling there, but they do have to work on some issues. Uh, as the fact that he was the man that created these weapons that can harm mutants. While a mutant himself is something that he is going to have to uh, face himself, right? By people who are who love him and know him and our fellow mutants are like, why would you do that? So he has to answer for a lot. He may be the cause of some of these things coming back to hit mutant kind now, like the the Sentinels and the and the depowering gun and what have you. Uh, the second part of the story is of Charles Xavier and his life in space with Lalandra. Uh, we see Lalandra announcing her and Charles's engagement uh, to be wed. Uh, Charles comes out, uh, like walks out in this nice um, Shi'ar. Uh, armor and uh, wants to ingratiate himself in with uh, the Imperium, so to speak, like that his life is about this now. Uh, we did pick up with an initial fight between the Shi'ar and Kree, where the Shi'ar wins that battle. Um, but Deathbird, uh, Lalandra's sister, is not very happy about this. Uh, she calls basically Earth, uh, Earth people, a bunch of simians, uh, people who were, uh, were, were ape-like, right? And that he's not even a full human, he's a mutant. And to muddy their loyal, uh, royal bloodline with such uh, mud blood, your mud blood, your mud blood blood, blood blood blood. <laughs> um is causing her to lay down a challenge for Lilandra and Charles to be married. And if they don't do that, then the chances are of Death Cry, a uh, Death Bird, sorry, uh, taking over the throne or having more people on her side will result in them not, you know, that's what will happen if they don't do this uh, challenge she lays down, which is. Lalandra has to take his memories of Earth and the X-Men and scrub them from his brain. Uh, basically cutting his ties to his heritage and to his people so he can concentrate on the Imperium, uh, the Shi'ar Empire. And when 
he kind of agrees to do that a little bit. He has a hard time really acknowledging that he wants to forget the X-Men. And a uh, battle breaks out between Deathbird and some of her people and Lalandra and her and uh, Gladiator and some of her people to where Charles, ex Charles stops everyone in their tracks because uh, he's acknowledging like, I have too much power to not help ease this problem down. And he brings them all to a class, so to speak, in the astral plane. And as he's discussing this and that about, like, it's our differences that bring us together. And we're allowing it to keep us apart. And, you know, that whole spiel of ethics that in a fantasy world, it's great that everyone can get along and work together. But that's always going to be impossible. It's impossible with your own family. You know what I mean? If you lived with nothing but friends and family, there will still be problems presented because of the different personalities that are interacting with each other. And the, the same techniques that you use for your family and friends are supposed to be used for the whole world. The problem is because we don't know X, Y, and Z person on the opposite end of the world from us, we're less likely to care about that person. Uh, and the same would go if you're on a completely different planet. Earth is going to be, and especially if you know how to master space travel and all this stuff, Earth is like the least likely place you want anyone to come from and muddle in royal affairs, so to speak, right? Like in uh, the English, uh, King George in England doesn't need me, the middle-aged Irishman from America, to tell him how to run his country, right? Um or for him to come tell me how I should live my life. Uh, so it's kind of that uh, mind frame. And it seemed like Charles was about to bring everyone on the same page when he got a vision of Gambit and his death. And then finally with his mind fully open, realizing what happened on Genosha. Oh, and by the way, Storm and Forge did also find out what happened at Genosha 2 when that Forge's cabin and they put on the TV must have been, you know, it's been a news cycle thing. Like if a whole country got destroyed, that'd be pretty much in the news cycle for at least a week. Uh, so Storm and Forge are devastated. Charles is in absolute shock. He's like my X-Men, my children of the Atom. And he lays there just in pure shock of what's going on on Earth. And he tells Alondra, I got to go. I have to go back to my ex-men. I got to go back to my people. And she's like, are you going to prove everything my sister's saying? And he's like, right, my people, right? Like, will you abandon your people for me and Earth? Probably not. And that's kind of where the episode ends. So I think we're definitely going to get Charles and uh, Storm and Forge that get back to Genosha or the X-Mansion. And I think that this is after what happens with the cleanup at Genosha. So, you know, I, f I feel like there's definitely going to be a Shi'ar attack or at least by Deathbird and attack by us, they might, this might even lead into uh, uh, some form of Operation Galactic Storm or something, I don't know. But I do know that um, the Shi'ar Empire is not gonna take this lightly after all the time and effort they put into Charles and accepting him, some of them. Uh, but what's really gonna be interesting is how uh, this story is gonna, how this season is gonna wrap up. There's so many, uh, oh, and then there was a, a scene at the end where Sinister kind of exposed himself as the culprit behind the Sinister, uh, behind the Genosian attack. So a lot of people calling Bastion, Bastion, Bastion. And he may be still somewhere around, but it seems like Sinister's behind this attack for some reason. And we'll find out in due time.
If you have any ideas or theories about how this season's going to end, let me know down below. But until then, peace, snookums.